Today I'm going to present the results of a three-year-long watershed assessment at Malakoff Diggins. The Humbug Creek Watershed Assessment and Management Recommendations document was released in 2016. This presentation has been given to the State Water Resources Control Board in 2015 and to the Nevada County Board of Supervisors in 2016. As the lead researcher on this project, I was able to utilize my graduate students from California State University, Chico, six of which have completed their master's theses on assessment topics. Their thesis topics help to expand the depth and breadth of the assessment efforts far more than would have otherwise been possible. The Department of Parks and Recreation have been invaluable as partners to this project. They help facilitate every aspect of this assessment by allowing us access to the site and to previous works completed. They continue to be active per partners as we advance in our understanding of the water quality impacts of this site. We continue to have project conference calls with Department of Parks and Recreation and have been providing assistance to them with respect to their permit requirements. They reviewed every aspect of this report before it was released and their comments and language suggestions were incorporated. A little bit of background, there are more than 40,000 abandoned mines in California. Uh, that's a daunting number. Um, mercury was mined from the Coast Range and brought up to the Sierra Nevada and used in both hard rock and hydraulic mining processes. It's estimated that 26 million pounds of mercury was brought up to the Sierra Nevada from the Coast Range and it's estimated that there's a 10 to 30 percent loss rate to the environment. So though the miners tried to use and reuse the mercury that they had imported to help capture the fine grain gold there was mercury lost to the environment during these rather messy processes. Mercury binds to fine grain gold, creating an amalgam, making it heavier and settle out more easily. That's what allows um, the recovery of that smaller grain size of gold. I think this picture is really helpful at understanding what happened at these hydraulic mine sites both how the hydraulic monitors power washed away the hillsides in order to get at the auriferous gravels that had, had gold in them, but also the sluice boxes that were used to convey that material away. And it's in those sluice boxes that liquid elemental mercury was added. So that's why we can understand that a lot was lost to the environment. Mine sites typically had a conveyance of sluice boxes so that material could be moved away from the workings and processed as it moved away. And then often there were tunnels installed at these hydraulic mine sites to convey the material to nearby streams and rivers. This is what Malakoff Diggins looks like today. It's a rare beauty of a hydraulic mine site. You can still see the cliffs that were exhumed or excavated during the hydraulic mining days, but you can also see a lot of recovery of vegetation on the pit floor, and even on the pit walls. I want to point out some key features which greatly informed how we do our assessment. The first is the Malakoff Diggins um, hydraulic mine pit at the top of the screen. It's more than 3,000 feet long, about 1,000 feet wide, and up to 600, 700 feet deep in, in different places. That pit currently drains out of the Hiller Tunnel the Hiller Tunnel was actually built prior to the excavation of this pit as part of a private mining claim. But as the pit has filled in, it has become the surface water discharge location for all the water that rains on and is captured by that pit. So Hiller Tunnel, tunnel is a current discharge point. The much larger North Bloomfield Tunnel um, that you see here on the screen going from pretty much the center of the pit all the way out to Humbug Creek, was constructed during um, the mining operations as a way to actively convey material away from the site. Building this tunnel was an engineering feat of its time. It has eight different access shafts, and they were um, excavated simultaneously working every face at the same time. So it was constructed in rapid time in order to allow this large-scale industrialized version of hydraulic mining to occur at this site. 
Today, these access shafts, at least the tops of them, can still be seen as you walk down the Humbug Creek Trail. Right now, the North Bloomfield Tunnel is completely plugged, as far as we can tell, um, and not conveying material from the pit into Humbug Creek. It does, however, collect um, groundwater seepage and does have a small discharge at its mouth as a result, at its outlet. Um, the other point of reference to have here is that Diggins Creek currently drains um, or receives the discharge from Hiller Tunnel and drains into Humbug Creek. And um, Humbug Creek, of course, flows into the South Huber River. So our assessment was guided by critical questions in three different areas, water quality, biotic sampling, and erosional processes. Today, I'll only really present on the water quality critical questions, the methods that we use to address those, and the findings. The purpose of uh, conducting this watershed, Humboldt Creek watershed assessment, was to identify recommendations for addressing water quality impairments and physical hazards in the Humboldt Creek watershed that is a result from the historic mining activities. So the water quality critical questions were, what is the annual sediment and mercury load in Humbug Creek? How much of that load is from storm events? Is mercury in Humbug Creek transported primarily as particulate bound mercury? Is suspended sediment in Humbug Creek directly correlated with mercury concentrations in Humbug Creek? And is Diggins Creek a significant source of sediment, mercury, or other metals to Humbug Creek? The sampling plan was to capture five storm events over two years and take grab samples at three locations. We selected a background location called Road 1, the discharge location at Hiller 2, um, which is the outlet of Hiller Tunnel, and downstream of where the discharge enters Humbug Creek. We called this Gauge 3 because we installed a gauge there. These sites were sampled during the rising, peak, and falling limbs of storm events. The samples were analyzed for total suspended sediment, mercury in both the total and dissolved forms, or filtered and not filtered forms, and other metals including copper, nickel, and zinc. We used EPA certified trace metal labs uh, to analyze the water samples, and samples were collected with the ultra clean hands technique. So continuous monitoring equipment was installed at the gauge on Humbug Creek downstream of the confluence with Diggins Creek. And the equipment allowed for stage and turbidity to be measured every 15 minutes. It also allowed for samples to be taken at regular intervals during the rising, peak, and falling limbs of storm events. These pictures give you an idea of what storm sampling at each site looked like. We have a picture from the background site at Road 1 at Hiller Tunnel and also at the gauge and confluence locations. So I mentioned that we sampled for both filtered and non-filtered um, mercury, and we sometimes refer to that as total and dissolved mercury. So I just thought I'd take a second here to be clear in that if two turbid samples were taken from a location looking like the ones on the left here, very brown, the lab would sample all of one of those samples and then a filtered and a non-filtered sample would be analyzed for mercury. And the difference between those two is what we refer to as particulate bound mercury. It's mercury that is associated with the fines. It's mercury that was filtered out when that sample was filtered. And to the right here, we have um, photo micrographs from an SEM from USGS of what mercury looks like on a piece of gold amalgam. So I just am putting this picture here as kind of a, a concept in that what we are imagining is that we have particulate bound mercury like this, this small bead, on a silter clay particle. And so that silter clay particle will stay in suspension for a long time, will travel long distances, but it has mercury on it. The samples that we took, the grab samples that we took, allowed us to determine the relationships between continuous and easy to measure parameters like turbidity 
and stage on the x-axis. With the less frequent grab sample collection and analysis for metals and total suspended sediment. The relationship between stage and discharge allowed us to create annual hydrographs. The relationship between turbidity and total suspended sediment allowed us to calculate annual sediment loads. And the relationship between turbidity and particulate bound mercury allowed us to calculate annual mercury loads. So by developing these relationships, even for these ranges that we've been able to monitor, we'll, we were able to predict for um, pretty much any turbidity level within that range what the associated particulate bound mercury level would be and the associated total suspended solid. Here are the hydrographs for the assessment period, which included water years 2012 and 2013 at the gauge site. You can see where the grab samples took place during the storm events, and you can see that summer base flow and winter base flow conditions were prevalent during much of the year. This is what hydrologists call a relatively flashy system in that water comes up quickly during storm events and also goes down quickly after those storm events. The relationships that were established can be used to visually display the turbidity and particulate bound mercury conditions over time. What you see is that when discharge increases during a storm, you have increased turbidity, increased total suspended sediment, and increased particulate bound mercury. Our turbidity meter was not able to make accurate readings above 1600 NTUs, and that's why these peaks look chopped off. This display allows you to see the frequency and duration of the turbid, turbid water conditions in Humbug Creek. It is event driven. It occurs when there's surface water runoff and it is significantly different from summer or winter base flows. This table is in the Humbug Creek Watershed Assessment Report. It summarizes these data into each water year, 2012 and 2013, and then into each storm event, the duration of the storm event and the load associated with each storm event. It's important to note that the largest storm in each water year accounted for half of that year's sediment and mercury load. And that a single storm can produce half of the annual sediment and mercury load, during which as much as three grams of mercury can be released from the site each day and 0.5 tons of sediment per hour. Taking a step back and looking at the data in the simplest way, the grab sample concentrations from each of the sites, Road 1, Hiller 2, and Gauge 3, for all five storm events, you can see two things. One is that the majority of the mercury is particulate bound. The second is that Hiller Tunnel is a major source of mercury to Humbug Creek. And it's important to note that there, are, that there may be other sources of sediment and mercury to Humbug Creek, in addition to the Hiller Tunnel outlet, that might contribute to the sediment and mercury load measured at the Humbug Gauge Station. So these data were used to answer or address the water quality criteria questions that we began with. The annual sediment load is about 500 tons per year. The annual mercury load is estimated to be about 100 grams per year. The mercury in Humbug Creek is primarily in particulate bound form, not dissolved. The particulate bound mercury is highly correlated with total suspended sediment. And Hiller Tunnel via Diggins Creek is a significant source of impaired water quality to Humbug Creek. In fact, it is a source of sediment, mercury, copper, lead, nickel, and zinc during these storm events. How can the pit be a source of contamination? Well, initially we thought that any mercury used at this site would be buried and that virgin gravels would be filling in the pit as it eroded and deposited. Instead, what we have found is that, yes, sand-sized particles and larger settle out and fill in the pit, but that fine silts and clays with particulate-bound metals travel in suspension long distances through the pit and are discharged out Hiller Tunnel 
into Dagon's Creek. This is a fundamentally new understanding with respect to mercury fate and transport. This understanding, in addition to a more complete picture from cultural resource experts about what activities took place in the pit and when and where, have given us a new conceptual model for mercury and how it moves through a watershed. There is current ongoing research as a part of the DWR funded work to look at the erosional processes of the pit walls using ground-based LIDAR with the help of USGS researchers. In particular, the mineralogy of samples from the pit wall material will be compared to storm samples on the pit floor to try and determine the origin of fine silts and clays in the pit. With respect to tributary input flows to the pit, our sampling so far has shown that they are not high in turbidity. That means that all of those R1 through R8 samples of streams coming into the pit have shown that they are not high in turbidity, suspended sediment, or metals, and that they account for about 10 to 20 percent of the discharge that comes out Hiller Tunnel. Additional monitoring of potential sites of contamination into Humbug Creek, mainly southeast and southwest of the pit, are also recommended. An additional water quality criteria question addressed in the Humbug Creek watershed assessment effort included the role of the North Bloomfield Tunnel. The North Bloomfield Tunnel at shaft five and at the mouth of the tunnel both have small amounts of discharge, about 0.3 CFS, continuously. The North Bloomfield Tunnel has eight different access shafts, some of which have standing water in them, the water at shaft five discharges into Humbug Creek, and the mouth of the tunnel also discharges into Humbug Creek. This is what shaft five looks like. Um, it's also known as the red shaft. It looks like a standing pool of water near the Humbug Creek Trail, but it has over 75 feet of standing water and likely extends as much as 200 feet down to the North Bloomfield horizontal shaft. When we sampled it, it had the highest concentration of mercury, two th over 2,000 nanograms per liter. This may be a result of using the tunnel itself as a sluice, which was recorded in the 1967 Jackson Report. The shaft also has elevated levels of nickel and zinc. To summarize, the peak measured values from Hiller, Shaft 5, and the mouth of North Bloomfield Tunnel are compared to common regulatory criteria in this table. At the end of the three-year assessment, some potential management recommendations were prioritized by a working group of advisors as options to address water quality concerns while protecting cultural resources. Some recommendations require that additional data gaps be addressed in order to inform the evaluation, selection, and design of management strategies. With respect to the pit, it may be worth considering the benefit of diverting water around the pit, since the pit is a source of contamination. In addition, it may be beneficial to retain sediment-laden water in the pit, allowing it to pass through a filtration structure. At this time, it appears that any activities that would reduce the turbidity of the water would also reduce the metal discharge, because the metals are primarily in a particulate bound form rather than in a dissolved form. There is very little discharge at the red shaft, making the elevated metal concentration small in comparison to the discharge from Hiller Tunnel. However, it's recommended that this site continue to be monitored. There's also very little discharge at the North Bloomfield Tunnel outfall, and it's recommended that this site continue to be monitored. It's also recommended that the physical hazards that some of the access shafts present be remediated, which is mostly underway as a result of Department of Parks and Recreation and Department of Conservation collaboration. Finally, though there is still much work to be done, we are at a critical juncture where much of the water quality problem has been described and work now needs to focus on identifying, evaluating, and designing solutions. The Department of Parks and Recreation is currently working with their consultants to conduct the technical and feasibility studies needed to advance this process forward towards evaluating and being able to select project alternatives.
The Humbug Creek Watershed Assessment document is available online, as is its executive summary. Thank you for your time today, your interest and support of this project, and for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. And thank you to all the graduate students and volunteers that made this work possible.